Welcome. I'm David the Good, and for the next hour, we're gonna look at launching your garden from scratch. I have a piece of land here, which we're borrowing. I don't actually have land of my own right now. So, since we have the chance to borrow this, we've cleared it out, we're gonna put in some garden beds, we're gonna get started for spring, and you're invited to come along. Let's get going. This piece of land is located near the ocean. It's a beautiful piece of land for building a house. And there's the remains of an old house here, which I've been told dates back to the 1800s, before it fell into such disrepair that the people in it moved out, the land got sold, and then trees grew up and covered the lot. Almost all the trees that you see here are regrowth trees, meaning they're the kind of trees that show up when you cut down the original trees and pioneer species come up. We've got nitrogen fixers and fast softwoods growing all over this. And the nice thing about it is because it's been sitting here for about 10 years or so without being cleared, the ground underneath is full of humus from all the dropping leaves. And so this is a great piece of land to garden on and we can build our gardens on it for the next couple of years until it gets built on again. So we've got a short period of time that we can go ahead and do whatever we want and we're going to be putting in some vegetables for this year, we're going to put in some corn, we're going to put in some pumpkins, but we're not going to put in any long-term perennials. When you first get a piece of land you want to look at a few things. You want to see what's there already. Do you have any potentially edible things growing like berries? You know I've I've looked at pieces of land that people wanted to clear and they're like, I'm just gonna cut through this. And you go through and you find persimmon trees, wild blueberries, wild blackberries, uh, edible mushrooms, all kinds of things that are already there that you can use. So I've already looked around here. The only thing that we found on this lot that we're definitely leaving alone is a big tamarind tree, which was lost among all the other trees. So that tamarind tree, we're gonna clear around it. but. Looking at the ground, what's your drainage look like? Do you have clay or do you have sand? Do you have a lot of rocks? You got a lot of roots? Do you have a slope? All these things are gonna influence what you do in your garden. I had a guy ask me recently what he should do. Should he mound up his pumpkin hills and his corn hills for a Three Sisters garden in the sand? He says, I live in Florida. I'm a native Florida cracker. He says, I've got fast, draining sugar sand. This is basically like beach sand. What do I do? Should I make mounds like it says on the back of all the packets? Yeah, you make a cucumber mound, right? But when you make a mound of sand, you get more drainage. It's gonna be worse. It's gonna be hotter and drier. And so he wanted, he said, should I grow in a pit? Should I grow flat? Yes, either of those. Probably go flat or go in a pit, but don't necessarily go with a nice big mound. It's not gonna do anything. If you double dig in sand, it doesn't really make any difference unless there's a little bit of loam in there to hold the structure together. So what we have here is we have rocky soil, we have a lot of roots, we have a lot of humus, and we've got a lot of clay in it. This is going to be very fertile soil. Um, where we're located is near old volcanic activity, so it's also volcanic soil, which is very good for minerals. And because the ground has not been tilled and torn up for a period of time, it's very rich. The downside is we've got a lot of chopping and clearing to do. So what I'm doing first is taking out, we took out all kinds of trees here, and then all these vines, there are roots all through the ground. We're gonna chop and take those out, and then we're going to dig our first bed. And if I'm feeling really ambitious, I'll dig some more later. But for now, let's take in this first bed. I'm gonna take a four by eight and I'm gonna clear it clean and then we're gonna start digging it up. And then we'll see what we do with seeds and transplants. Got all these jungle roots finding everything up here.
You have to be careful. You hear that ticking sound? That ticking sound. All right, ants. Tuck tuck ants, we call them. They make a ticky sound and they have stings like wasps and they always live in decaying material. The crying you sound is a newborn baby who's hanging out with the camera lady. But. Snap, crackle, pop. That's the sound of serious pain if I bump into those guys. So I'm just gonna carefully move this junk out of here so I can clear it. The nice thing is, is all this rotten wood is also good for the soil. And the ants do their job breaking it down. They always live in decaying organic matter. They build big scary nests in it. And I don't wanna get anywhere close to them. It's like a scorpion getting stung by them. starting your garden in your lawn I just want you to be really grateful for the fact that you can just cut up a piece of grass and get started just 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 be glad that you're not in the rainforest this is not really what it's made for but it's such a tough tool I use it anyways it's easier than digging with a shovel Look at all these roots, this is ridiculous. If you're worried about the tuk-tuk ants coming back and being in the garden bed, don't worry about it. They, uh, they only like to be around the decaying organic matter, so they'll carry their babies off somewhere and start a new colony where they can bite somebody else. This is like uh, heart of darkness territory digging this bed here. Hope you're all entertained. I'll probably get to about 59 minutes of this presentation and I'll finish the bed. Now I've dug my beds and it's time to put in transplants. Generally, I, I like to uh, direct seed, but I got transplants for really cheap of a variety of different things. I thought, you know what, let's just go with transplants because it looks better. The reason I like to seed directly is that I believe you get better root growth and they often will outpace transplants. But for showing off in the time that we have to record now, transplants. There are reasons to do transplants. I mean, if you live further north, you have a shorter season, you start your transplants early and you put them out. Uh, but generally, I like to, I just like to go from seed if I can help it. Um, but I've got other transplants that I started at the house from seed before we had this land. This land only just came open, so transplants it is. We're going fast and quick and all that stuff. The way I do these beds is on purpose. Uh, these are basically kind of a modified uh, John Jeevan's approach. We loosened the soil and we made beds that are about four to five foot wide so you can reach through the middle and it's, uh, you know, if they go too wide, it's a pain in the neck to get in and do what you need to do. And I have in the past made uh, paths between the bed that are too thin. I've had, if I say, well, if I've got all this space, I want two to three foot spaces between the beds. If you have a really limited space, okay, maybe you do two foot. But if you get much narrower than that, as the plants start to fill out and grow, it's not very good. I also don't like to put borders on my beds. We just dug them, loosened them up, and kind of mounted the soil and raked them even, broke the clay up, and they're, they're mounded. And we will weed the beds and the paths in between, but I like to move stuff around all the time, so I, I'm really not interested in making permanent looking beds. 
and these look really cool when they have plants in them anyways. If you have to bother with doing all the borders and all that sort of thing, I've, I've done it before where I've, I've so many times, you can ask my wife, we have built the system, we have the system of beds where I framed it out and cut the wood or stacked the stones or at one point I knocked a bunch of bottles into the ground in rows, that was the worst one because sometimes the bottles would break. And we did all these different different methods and sometimes if you put in cinder blocks they'll be like, well you don't know what was in those cinder blocks, they could be leaching this and that and the other thing and you're like, oh shoot. Well, I'll switch to wood. So you put up wood and they say, oh man, when that pressure treated rots, it kills everything. Oh shoot, well what am I gonna do? Uh, I'll put in cedar. Well, and then you go and you look at the price of cedar and you say, forget it, I'm not doing that. Anyhow, you can put boundaries on beds if you want to, but I don't bother anymore because pretty much about the time I think that I've got, the, I had the boundaries right, I would realize, I actually think it would be better if we reorganized this way and then I'd wanna move it all again. I like to change from season to season. Sometimes I'll have rounded beds like these and then in a couple of seasons I might knock it down and plant corn over the whole area and not have it in these beds. I might decide I'm going to make a big circle one year. It doesn't matter. I can switch, the, the move the dirt around as I like. I'm really, if you want to go fast and you want to go easy, we can dig one of these beds in about an hour or less. Uh, including clearing all the weeds and everything out and then you are ready to go. You don't have to go and borrow a miter saw and buy some wood or haul block or any of that nonsense. It doesn't, the plants don't care. So just go with it. Just dig dig these rounded corner things and get going. Don't don't make the excuse that you, you know, you've got to wait for your buddy to come over with a saw or your husband hasn't gotten the block for you yet or whatever. No, nah, I mean just go out and start digging and the plants are, they, they honestly don't care. Um, they know that you love them and that you've prepared a place for them. So anyhow, let's get transplanting. I've got cauliflower here and I've got cabbages mixed in. I don't know which is which anymore. And then I have some lettuce and then I've got some bell peppers here. And I'm just gonna mix them in and we'll see what we get and how it looks. I think I'll go with sort of a random distribution because that's more exciting. Let's plant. <laughs> it's nice to see. There, go help. I don't like to plant too closely. You think that you're gonna get more production because you've got more plants, but what I've actually found and what I learned from my friend, Steve Solomon, who I consider my gardening mentor, is that um, when, you, when you jam stuff in really closely, they are fighting for resources. And so they're looking for the nutrition and they're looking for the water and they're fighting with each other and so they don't produce as much. I go further apart. John Jeevens would disagree with me. I borrow his bed, but I don't borrow his spacing. I don't want to have to, if you watch those videos on, um, that John Jeevens put up on YouTube or his group did, they're great for showing you how to dig, dig and all that, but you realize they are watering those beds two times a day and they've got that beautiful California soil and that beautiful California climate. And I, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I don't want to have to water that often. And if you, if you actually get to a point where you spread them far enough out, they'll go for days or even a week or more sometimes. Sometimes they'll even grow depending on the crop. I've grown corn with no irrigation whatsoever, just planting when the rains are coming and letting them live on their own. So if I go broader like this, I've got the space to let them uh, get their own resources. There are a lot of clods in here. It's rough, because this is definitely clay. is down the middle here.
the lettuce are short term. The uh, peppers are gonna grow and be here for a long time compared to the lettuce. The lettuce will be out of here quickly. I'm just gonna stick them in the middle. By the time we're pulling them, the uh, peppers will be coming close to touching. This is a, this is the most junky place I think I have ever gardened. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> it's a Coke bottle. It's, <laughs> okay, that's just perfect. All right, we will replace the Coke bottle with a bell pepper. <laughs> that's funny, you couldn't plan that. I don't know how we got through digging with that bottle in there and missed it. One of these days I'm gonna find some Spanish gold. Repository of compostables. When you're done recycling, you know it's toast postable. David the Good, oh, it's so blog postable. And his herb chicken is made. There we go. Cauliflower and cabbage is down the middle. And that is tobacco on the outside. That ought to keep them safe, right? Keep every bug in the world away. Those first two beds were not enough space for uh, the transplants that we have, so there's a third bed right here. And I figure, well, I'm gonna show you how I break these quick and easy. You can do this with a spading fork, you can do it with a shovel, or you can do it with a broad fork. And I have the broad fork, so what I do is I just clear a spot on the ground. We, there, were, there was a lot of uh, bush material here. I mean, there was all kinds of like, bits of trees and vines and all kinds of nonsense and so once it cleared that then uh you just jam this into the ground and it kind of finds its way and it breaks it so it's like having a fork but it allows you to go a little deeper and turn it's at 14 inch tines on it i think i must demonstrate this thing like in every single one of my grow network presentations um because since I discovered it and I made friends with the owners and they pay me a couple million dollars a year to just put this thing in all of Marjorie's videos, I, uh, I just I have to, you know, I, I am contractually obligated to uh, show the meadow creature. Actually, no, I mean, I would, I would do this thing even if I wasn't friends with them. Uh, but it's just, I like this a lot better than using a fork. I find the motion to be quite a bit easier than jamming the fork in the ground and twisting it. I'm not like on the ab destroyer workout right now. I, I prefer this kind of rowing motion. So once you break it, this has a lot of clay in it. You can see how it, it grabs the soil and busts it up. Once it's uh, loosened like this, you just take your shovel or hoe or whatever and crack the clods or you do it by hand. And then you rake your planting bed and voila, you've got a wonderful place to put your transplants. Go. I'm just 
going to rake it even and it's ready to plant. That's all we did. A few weeks ago I started some Tabasco pepper seeds which uh, I was able to get in from the states and uh, as far as I know I'm the only person that's going to be growing these Tabasco peppers so I'm kind of excited about that. And in order to transplant these I have a very specialized tool which my wife conveniently leaves in the silverware drawer. It's like my favorite transplanter for small plants and I'm going to transplant them. We're going to dig them out of here and we're going to put them in at the other property. I want to get underneath their roots as best as I can to get, you know, you want a lump of dirt if you can help it. More is better. So that's like awesome right there. If we can hold on to lumps like that, that's what we need. I want great big lumps of dirt. Transplanting is a big deal. If you've ever moved across from one house to another house, you know that it's a big deal to move. Now imagine that you were physically jammed into that house, like through the wall of the house, and then you had to be busted out. And you might understand just a little bit the pain that these plants feel. Okay, these are, uh, these are called Celosia argentia. They are a relative of spinach and amaranth that we use as a green, so I'm going to take some of those too. Here's another pepper. These have gotten a little leggier than I would like, but they should be fine after a few days they'll adjust. Peppers are tough. Some plants will just simply die on you. Others can take it. Peppers can usually take a little bit of abuse. Now that's not good. Don't want to do that. So I will cover these roots up with a little bit of the soil and I'll probably sprinkle them with a little water just to make sure that they stay until they get transplanted. Some of these littler, there's some littler ones in here like this one. I'm just going to leave these until they get bigger. Water them in. Ah, oh, you have a stinging nettle. I was wondering why my hand is starting to sting. This is not one of my transplants. This is a stinging nettle. And that's why the side of my arm is suddenly stinging here. <laughs> they're, uh, they're good for you nutritionally, but I don't actually want them in my garden. And I don't enjoy getting stung. Let's take one more here. And let's take this last one here and see if we can get some roots on it. It's up against the side. It's not as good, but... Oh yeah, there we go. It's a nice big hunk of roots. There we go, that's enough to transplant for now. introduce you guys to our uh, part of our recycling program here. This guy turns extra vegetables and weeds into manure. My children discovered him actually in a lot and his name is Caspian. That's what my kids named him. And he did, they discovered him. He had actually been injured and he was half starved. He's a domestic, obviously a tame rabbit, but they discovered him when they were out biking and brought him in and I thought, oh no, the last thing I need is a animal that doesn't produce to take care of. And then I remembered how much manure rabbits make and I thought, you know what? I think the kids can have a bunny. This is not an eating bunny. This is a very lucky bunny uh, to have been rescued, obviously been treated very badly and uh, he's gonna make lots of manure for the garden, right? So we'll feed him weeds and he turns the weeds into manure. If you have rabbit manure to use in your gardens, that is one of the absolute best manures. It's fantastic stuff. 
and it's sort of like a slow release fertilizer, right? Hey, you're a lucky bunny, aren't you? Lucky bunny eating kale. Yeah. <laughs> Turn into manure, all right? They look sad, but they'll recover. It's going to be very important to keep these guys watered. It's the dry season right now. We don't hit the wet season for a few more months. And, uh, you know, particularly when you transplant, again, they're under a lot of stress. So you got to just keep water on them, water on them, water on them, water on them until they get their roots in place and they can do what they need to do. They're already wilting just after, you know, the five minutes or so it took me to get them down here and get them in the ground and they're surrounded by clods. They need to be really watered in and I'm gonna have to do this for the next few days. Carry a water over, keep them watered, keep them soaked. If you have a really sunny day, you might have to do it twice. But after a few days, as again, you can see I gave them wide spacing, they're gonna be able to take care of themselves. Right now though, they're very vulnerable. You just don't want them to suffer that much right at the beginning. Just soak them and soak them and soak them and then soak them again. Be nice to your mother and always say please. Be loyal to friends and compost your enemies. Be nice to your mother and always say please. Be loyal to friends. Right here is where I'm going to put my compost pile. We live about a block that way. So all the kitchen scraps and everything's, everything needs to get carried over here. And so I want to make it convenient to the road. If you look over here, there's the road. And so this is the most convenient spot off of the road that is open and it's shaded so it's not going to be baked by the sun which is good we don't want it being baked by the sun it's not going to get pounded by the rain so much so this is where i'm going to make the compost and it is also very close to the gardens the gardens are like 20 feet that way so i'm going to start this here i'm not going to do an entire pile on video because i don't have enough stuff yet but over time we'll just keep piling it up I'm not really interested in having to turn it regularly or all that stuff. It's just going to be a continuously digesting pile for a few months. Then we will turn it out, sift the compost out of it, and do it again. Just a simple pile, letting nature do the work. And first thing I'm going to do here is lay down some sticks for a little bit of air underneath, and then we'll throw a couple of layers on. Just give a little bit of breathing room between the ground and the pile. It doesn't really matter all that much. You don't have to do this. Probably don't even have to do it, you know, at all. Probably I don't even need to do it. Probably this entire demonstration is completely insane. No, it's not. I saw people do this on YouTube, so I know it's real. I'm just kidding, of course. I literally wrote the book on composting. Well, I literally wrote a book on composting. Compost Everything, The Good Guide to Extreme Composting. This is some bunny bedding, which I think is perfect here. It's funny, it's been sitting in this bucket. It's already warm in this bucket. This is your carbon material, so I'm putting down some carbon. And then I have some nasty, nasty kitchen scraps I'm gonna throw on top of that. These are some really grody scraps. If you have a weak stomach, please stop watching right now. Look at that. 
It's all full of worms. Isn't that disgusting? Well, guess what? Those are doing good work. Got designed flies to clean things up. Oh, man, and the smell. It smells like ammonia. You know what it means when it smells like ammonia? It means it's off-gassing nitrogen. You can actually take ammonia and thin it out and use it for a fertilizer, believe it or not. It's insane, but it works. All tons of nitrogen in here. So now I'm gonna move that around a little bit and then we will throw some more carbon on top so it doesn't stink so badly. So every time we get a layer of green stuff, that's the sloppy nasty stuff, or green grass or green leaves or whatever, which is higher in nitrogen, we throw another layer of browns on top of it. So when we haul in the stuff from the kitchen, and dump it over here. We're just gonna rake up some leaves and throw it over the top. Here's another bucket. Been saving from the kitchen for quite a while now because this land just opened up for us. There we go. It's not quite as nasty as the first one. Now I throw in paper towels and scrap paper from around the house as well because that's carbon material and it composts just fine. If it's like all weird and plasticky and multicolored, don't throw it in, but I mean, shoot, I have no problem using uh, paper plates, towels, napkins, you know, paper towels, napkins, that kind of stuff, all works. Now, I'm gonna cover that with some more carbon. I don't have a rake because it broke while we were doing this demonstration. <laughs> They're pulling and catching it on roots and the head fell off and I haven't fixed it yet but the side of one of these hoes works really nicely for gathering. Gathering up carbon like a boss. And I'm not gonna bother taking the little sticks and stuff out of here. It's all gonna rot, except we don't have to go really fast. We just want a place for the compost to just keep happening continuously. So all the stuff from the house eventually gets fed into the garden beds. There's the beginning of a compost pile. That is the easiest you can do. Throw it on the ground. There you go. That's how we establish some garden beds from scratch. Simple, dig the beds, put in transplants or plant some seeds, get them watered, and I almost always, when I'm starting a new garden, well, no, I always do. I always start a compost pile and I put it near the gardens because anytime you got a little extra something to throw in there, you throw it in there and eventually you've got it to feed the next round of the beds. These are gonna do really well because this area was under forest. There's a lot of humus in the soil. There's a lot of worms. This is rich. It's gonna need probably nothing to feed it for the first harvest, but we're gonna have to replenish the humus after that and keep it fed up. So that's where the compost pile is gonna come in handy. Now, if you wanna follow what I'm doing in my garden beds and everything from here on out, I know this is a very simple introduction. I've got a ton more, everything from grafting to extreme composting and composting toilets and uh, uh, tropical gardening, growing and seeing plants that you probably have never seen before, like cocoa. It's all on my website, thesurvivalgardener.com. And for all the videos, follow me on YouTube. I'm David the Good. There is going to be a link next to this video, a little ad for my YouTube channel. You can click there and subscribe and follow what I'm doing. I try to keep it interesting and we have a lot of fun. Oh, I forgot. There's one last thing I didn't do for these garden beds. You've got to grow cabbage, more power to you. You gotta grow. Plants love this 90s alternative. You have to do 90s alternative songs to them or else they're, they're totally gonna die. So, you just, this is, this is part of it, I'm serious. Go to Bats, go, go Celosia, yeah, yeah. Thanks for watching, and until next time, may your thumbs always be green. Get up in the morning time, making biscuits. Get up in the middle of the noonday biscuits Get up in the 
afternoon making biscuits get up in the middle of the night time biscuits get up in the morning time making biscuits Singing corn to her corn. Or maybe singing some tempo pilots. Oh, I don't know. But sing to your place. I'm telling you, it works. Works. It works.